we really want this issue to get the kind of focus that it, it deserves and to the degree that as our evolving work as IBW, um, as our work evolves, you know, to see the degree to which we can uh, be a part of it with Reverend Wilson playing a central role because he has obviously national reach, faith leaders all across the country, activists all across the country, uh, and whatnot. So I'm going to turn to his twin. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. Thanks a million. Um, as I look at what my responsibilities are today, I say they're pretty easy, you know. But it's also in the perspective of what I heard the reporting and the contents of the things that's occurring. And it seems to me the more they change, the more they remain the same, you know, at the end of the day. And it brings about my particular perspective in the contents of Reverend Wilson. Occasionally, great men come along that have the opportunity to make transformation and changes in this world for us as people. And we are confronted with the challenges of changes. To a large degree, we don't realize the impact of certain angels and not understanding their full capacity and the ability to make transformation. But some of the times we do. And I think this is one of the times that we realize who is amongst us that have the capabilities of making transformation for us as we proceed on. Reverend Wilson comes outside of the church with a special yoke of confirmation. Prior to him doing anything, he has three standards. First, is it right? Secondly, is it for his people? Third, is it controversial? If the answer is yes to all three, then he goes further with his affirmation, which is my God, my family, my people. I've seen him lead demonstrations in regards to stopping them, all the traffic on 14th Street Bridge Margining it all the way back to Lawton Reformatory, almost 33 miles on a Monday morning at 7 o'clock a.m., where everybody went to jail because of the protest. And they was asked, while well, being in court, pay the $50 and you can leave. Reverend Wilson said, no, I will not pay $50. I want my day in court because I have a message that must be heard. The guns that was coming into the District of Columbia was coming from the state of Virginia that was killing a large amount of our kids. This message must be heard. And it was during the presidential election that he beat the drum on that. But not only that, coming outside the church, a Korean decided to disrespect a black woman. Reverend Wilson mobilized a march around that and for 45 days closed it down. Yep. For disrespecting a black woman. This is the spirit of what we have in front of us today. The executive director of the Million Man March that brought more than two million black men to Washington, D.C. on the Capitol in a peaceful perspective. For peace be still, for we now have among us a presentation from Dr. Reverend. Willie F. trying to bring about change and make a difference for the uh, masses of our people. I want to thank Brother Ron here uh, for asking me to come tonight. Um, I, uh, I'm the president of my family reunion, which is celebrating its 84th anniversary this year. And we have a teleconference call at 8. Uh, and I might have to slip out just for a minute to be on it and just make my presence known and It'll come right back if we are still convening at that point. I want to be preemptive in just a moment and say because 
There are so many issues that confront us as a community and as, as people who have been fighting for our liberation and our freedom for all these hundreds of years. Uh, we are doing and tend to do the 20th year recognition, should I say, because it won't be a celebration, the 20th year recognition of the Million Man March in October of this year, which is about six months from now. And uh, we will be shaping, and some of you who are sitting here right now will be called upon in the next few days as we strategize in terms of an agenda, which will speak not to a celebration but some demands mm -hmm. that we're going to make on mm -hmm. this United States government. Mm -hmm. uh, I expect that there will be several million of us because the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times in terms of what's going on, uh, certainly foments the kind of energy that says we must do something and we must do something now. So I just wanted to be preemptive in saying that in terms of uh, strategy meetings that will be taking place in the next week or so. Uh, and some of you will be asked to attend those meetings so that we can strategize and map out uh, our agenda for that coming together, which uh, we want to make an, a, 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 an appreciable difference. And I think it's so strategic at election time uh, mm -hmm. that uh, we bring all of this uh, together. Let me just say a few things, and I jotted down a couple of things so that I won't forget and uh, um, try to be as brief as I possibly can laying out. But my attention was arrested when, as a part of our efforts at Union Temple a couple of years ago now, we did a a whole month on uh, uh, slavery and the continuation of that slavery in America. Um, as we watched the video of slavery by another name, my attention was pricked by uh, that phrase of the phase of the video where it showed uh, president, former President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1934 meeting with AFL, the labor, to discuss after having viewed the horrendous conditions that were prevalent in the uh, 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 ongoing uh, uh, coal mines and uh, the railroad work uh, where the reinstatement of slavery had been instituted. I want to look at an historical picture just for a minute and then close with what was the federal uh, prison industries uh, mandate that came out of uh, 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 the president's uh, 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 directive of 1934, which introduced and uh, established the federal prisons uh, uh, and put into place Unicor and a lot of what we see going on today. Um, our black prince, Malcolm X, said on one occasion that when you look at history, mm. you're looking at the origin of a thing. Mm. And if you look at the origin of a thing, it leads to the cause of a thing. And if you understand the cause of a thing, you understand the reason that uh, institutions, issues, people, incidents are the way that they are. And so, uh, as I have over the last couple of years began to look at history in this respect as it relates to the ongoingness of slavery in this country, which is, has been ongoing from the time, from its incipiency even to the present time. It has never stopped. Um, so that when we look at Michelle Alexander's uh, uh, signal work, uh, and the much ballyhooed and heralded work it is, uh, where she talks about the new Jim Crow, a much more apt and appropriate uh, perspective on it will be the old slavery. Mm -hmm. Because the old slavery has never ceased uh, to exist. Um, that as we look at it, I want to look at just for a minute, if you give me about 10 minutes, I think I can focus this. If we look at uh, 
what occurred after uh, uh, so-called Emancipation Proclamation, that uh, the plantations were in shambles, mm -hmm. the uh, economy in the South particularly, and even the North, was collapsing because of no longer the use of all of this free labor and that has made this country so great as it is today. And so the state governments were broke, plantations were desecrated, industry was disorganized, and added to this was the demoralizing defeat of the South in the Civil War and the concomitant freedom, if you will, so-called, of those who had been uh, in slavery which became uh, a major issue. And as they looked at these freed slaves, as they looked at the defeat in the Civil War, as they looked at uh, what had been done, uh, added to this then was what we call the first reconstruction mm -hmm. from 1863 to 1877, when uh, uh, Lerone Bennett wrote an article in Ebony Magazine in 1981. The title of that article was, Will the Gains of the 1960s Be Lost? And in talking about that, he went back and cataloged the fact that during Reinstruction, we had black governor, we had black mayors, we had blacks in Congress, we had black police chiefs, we had uh, public accommodation laws, we had voting rights laws, we had all of those things which only added to the uh, anger, the resentment right. of whites who uh, had lost the, the, the power, and particularly the poor whites, right. uh, who had lost their one-upmanship, if you will, right. uh, uh, over blacks in this country. We know that uh, slavery wasn't, and lest I diverge, please, I don't want to go too far, but uh, we know that uh, 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 after uh, uh, slavery, uh, or rather in the advent of slavery, that the very first slaves were Irish. The Irish were the niggers of Europe. Mm -hmm. And that because before Columbus came to America, he went to the Caribbean islands of Montserrat. And those Irish people intermingled with indigenous African people there. And uh, then uh, uh, the covenant for Anacostia, for example, in 1794, said no blacks, no Irish, mm -hmm. no soap making uh, 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 in uh, the community where Union Temple is located. Uh, uh, you might go there now and you see a big sign in front of the site of the old Union Temple that says uh, Town Market Square. Actually, that was the slave market where slaves in Anacostia mm. were sold because Cedar Hill mm. was the home of the largest slave owner in Anacostia. A lot of us think that that house was originally owned by Frederick Douglass, but he got it in a fire sale mm. when that slave owner uh, uh, could no longer control all of his holdings in Anacostia. In fact, mm. the site where the current Union Temple is was the site of the largest plantation mm. in Anacostia. But I diverged for a minute. Uh, but, but as we, as we, as we, as we, as we went forth uh, in, in, in this slave period, uh, this first reconstruction, Lerone Bennett said, will the gains of the 1960s be lost? He went back then and cataloged how we had the black governor and the black mayors and the black police chiefs and the public accommodation laws. We could go anywhere. We had voting rights laws. And then uh, come uh, the president of Rutherford B. Hayes, and with the stroke of a pen, uh, we went back to where we were. So indeed, he was trying to say that even though those same gains had been made in the 1960s, right. that the very same thing occurred uh, in the 1860s and 1870s during that first reconstructing period, and it was quite possible because blacks were heard to say in that period of reconstruction, slavery has forever been abolished. There's no more racism in America. And in a few days, we will be lynched again and we were being 
having to walk on the other side of the street when we saw a white person coming. So then, in the midst of all this then, there was this major white backlash, mm -hmm. uh, if you can call it that. And uh, what would make it possible for us then, talking about white folks, to reclaim our wealth, which we have lost. We have lost this free labor that we had, and we got to regain it. And the answer was mm -hmm. the resubjugation of black folk. So that when so-called Emancipation Proclamation took place, in just a few days, with the laws already having the law, the amendment to the Constitution, the 13th Amendment, saying that there would be no slavery except when a person had been convicted uh, of a crime. So that was already there. Then on the heels of that came the black codes. And what these black codes said was then that for any reason, just as is the case now in 2015, uh, many black men are arrested. So that for vagrancy, mm -hmm. having just been released from slavery right. with no job, mm -hmm. to be arrested for having no job, mm -hmm. to be arrested for looking a white person in the face, to be arrested for not going to the other side of the street, to be arrested for, as African people are wont to do, congregating on a corner, just shooting the breeze, uh, to, to be arrested for uh, having some money, to be arrested for not having some money. All of these things became laws that were put on the books, so coupled with the uh, 13th Amendment, then slavery was immediately almost reinstated mm -hmm. and then through uh, 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 trumped up charges, mm -hmm. contrived crimes, as was just mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, black persons in wholesale numbers were remanded to uh, uh, the coal mines which were owned by, and of course the illusion is that all of this was just happening in the South when it was all over America. Right. Uh, uh, the uncovering of the graves in 1999 in New York yeah. where they uncovered several thousand graves of African people uh, and of course uncovered many uh, uh, caskets that had the Adinkra symbols carved into them and certain uh, tools of African people, but much more so than that uncovered the fact that slavery was just as predominant in the North as it was in the South and so that we know why Wall Street was established because there was a wall to keep slaves from escaping as they were traded on Wall Street. That was the very first thing traded on Wall Street. So then, uh, these trumped up charges that uh, uh, came forward uh, 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 made it possible to sell, resell, and lease uh, black folks and put them back into slavery. So many of them were sent to the coal mines of Alabama and Tennessee uh, uh, that were owned by U.S. Steel and American Steel, uh, the Pratt mines in Alabama. Uh, 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 and, the, and, and the net effect of this was uh, then uh, sheriffs, state governments, uh, court clerks, uh, judges who were often just the owner of the plantation next to the plantation <laughs> that needed some workers. Yeah. <laughs> they would then uh, 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 buy these, uh, 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 accuse somebody, for example, of not having any money. Mm -hmm. Bring them before the judge who was the owner of the plantation who needed right. some more slaves right. and say, uh, this man uh, uh, doesn't have any money and uh, uh, I find him uh, $25, which was a major amount of money at that time. Mm -hmm. And then because that man did not have the $25, okay, supposedly uh, no money was exchanged for real, that slave owner of the plantation would say, well, I'll pay it. And then that uh, black man would have to sign a paper of, uh, saying that he had to work off that debt. Mm -hmm. And so slavery was reinstituted. Mm -hmm. And it went on so that uh, when... Uh, that period of two years was over working in the mine, the coal mines, or working on a plantation, or working for somebody's business. When that time was over, then another charge was created. And that person was continually and perpetually in slavery, and that slavery went on. So that uh, uh, the coal mines particularly became gold mines. 
uh, U.S. Steel, American Steel, Carnegie Steel, Pratt, a coal mines of Alabama, uh, the Tennessee coal, uh, the railroads, all of these begin to lease, buy, sell, resell black men and women back into slavery uh, uh, as a result. So that uh, the U.S. Steel, for example, had, to write, had the rights to every person who was, quote, convicted of a crime on these false charges in 1908. Mm -hmm. every, every living black man in America who in 1908 was accused of a crime, the rights to that person was U.S. Steel. Uh, uh, steel and cotton be, be, was shipped at this time to 35 different states and tens of millions of dollars were poured into the state coffers of Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, uh, Louisiana, uh, Alabama, <laughs> South Carolina, North Carolina, uh, and this peanut system was the root of it all. Now, I'm going to stick a pin in there for a minute, and I hope I'm not taking too long. No, no, no. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, I'll stick a pin in that for a minute, but I want to say that the conditions were so horrible in the coal mine with human excrement and, and, and in the water that the men had to drink 1,700 feet below ground level uh, uh, in a situation where they were in claustrophobic uh, phobic conditions and where disease was rampant. And, where, and what I want you to see is that the same things that are going on in prison today, all the older prisoners had young prisoners as young as 12 years old, many of whom came from Freedom Village uh, in uh, Arlington Cemetery. And of course, everybody here knows that that land that is now Arlington Cemetery was originally Freedman's Village, where many of the former freed slaves lived. And it was Sojourner Truth who fought that battle when many of the 12, 13, 14 year old boys from Freedom's Village at Arlington Cemetery were captured and carried down south and made to work as slaves on these plantations and in these coal mines and they became the gal boys of the older uh, 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 inmates who had been incarcerated on these false trumped up charges. I want you to keep that in your mind because when we get to 1982 when Ronald Reagan introduces his trumped up charges you can see the same situation occurring all over again. Mm. So that was then this uh, the, uh, the the disease that was rampant, and, we, uh, and all the things that what they call black damp, which was a combination of carbon dioxide and nitrogen, which these black men and women were breathing in 24 seven as they worked down these coal mines. So Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1934, when he saw these horrid conditions invited the labor unions to the White House. It was then that he issued Executive Order 6917, which established the Federal Bureau of uh, uh, Prisons uh, Industries, which ultimately becomes Unicor, which ultimately becomes the organization that has 175 factories, which becomes the organization that in 2013 had a profit margin of $765 million, which became the uh, uh, operation that uh, uh, created everything and produces everything for, for, for Revlon, for, for Compaq, for IBM, for, for, for that group that makes 95% of the paint and the paint brushes that we paint our houses with, 45% of the office furniture, 35% of the furniture that's in our homes, Revlon, Nordstrom's, uh, the list just goes on and on. Over 175 different companies that are now getting the cheap labor uh, of, free sl of slaves who are in the prison institutions who make anywhere from 23 cents to $1.15 an hour, out of which they must pay court fines, court costs, uh, child support, uh, anything, so that there's no money left for them to do anything, even though they're not making anything to start with. So then, uh, what we have then, as we look at, I'm trying to go f f fast here, uh, the second reconstruction, starting around 1954 with Barry Goldwater, mm -hmm. taken up by uh, Nixon, then reinforced by uh, President Ronald Reagan, 
the whole, uh, to hide, here's what we call, we had what we call the conservative revolution. Uh, uh, didn't want to come out blatantly and, and, and show their racism. So they hid it behind law and order. Mm -hmm. and, and, and behind the, the idea of welfare queens. To, to, and, and the poor whites understood what they were really saying. Uh, the same anger that existed uh, following 1865 uh, surfaced again. That anger which was resentment because of the same public accommodation laws that had been passed during the first Reconstruction were passed again uh, 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 under Lyndon Baines Johnson. The same voting rights laws, the same public accommodation laws, uh, uh, the same voting rights laws that had been passed a hundred years ago were passed again. Our, 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 our dear brother uh, uh, Angus Wilson made us to know uh, some years before he passed that uh, laws don't mean a thing. Uh, because we see that in this situation here, how the same laws that had been passed a hundred years before uh, ended up being wiped away and had to be passed again in 1968, a uh, uh, hundred years later. So then, this white back, white back last against affirmative action, against uh, uh, all that was quote so called done for these lazy Negroes who don't want to work. And now you're doing all these things for them. And so Ronald Reagan rolled that That's right. into the White House. And then uh, with this same mentality of hiding the racism, came up with this law and order and introduced the idea of uh, uh, the war on drugs. And uh, which was the same situation with the black codes. Uh, trumped up charges that would reestablish slavery in the same sense that had been done a hundred years previous. So that uh, uh, with this war on drugs, and of course in uh, 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 1988, CIA uh, admitted that uh, uh, they had whitewashed the sale and the flow of drugs into our communities by the Nicaraguan guerrillas who uh, uh, were being supported by the U.S. government at that time. And so uh, then, just as the law was used, <coughs> laws were created. Again, uh, Congress passed laws, uh, long <coughs> mandatory sentences mm -hmm. for uh, crack cocaine usage and uh, the law of three strikes and you write out. So that uh, if you look at this, in terms of the, the, the parallel and the similarities with the black code, it's the same situation. Uh, laws having been created to perpetuate uh, this free labor so that uh, individuals would work year in and year out for no pay. Now, the question that I pondered in my mind as I looked at this was why did uh, uh, labor not fight? When FDR in 1934 invited them to the White House, and they came to the White House and they were vehemently opposed because you can uh, know how many thousands of jobs were taken from the public sector, and they went in with the argument, you're going to take thousands upon thousands of jobs from the community. And I failed to mention as well the same economic uh, collapse that occurred after the end of the Civil War again occurred. Why? Because of globalization, because of deindustrialization, uh, 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 and because of technology. That was uh, a, a beginning of a collapse of the economy in this country. And so then, as it was with the black codes, what is the way that we can begin to regain the wealth? And the answer was the re-establishment of slavery mm -hmm. at the same level that it existed uh, uh, back in 1865, 66, when they re-established the same thing. So then uh, the prison population, as we know, in 1950, there were less than 150,000 black men incarcerated. Mm -hmm. 1982 to the present, from 300,000 to two million in the jails and penal institutions of this country. So that, what was the result? 
as it was back then, it represents the rebuilding of little towns all over America. Pratt, uh, uh, Alabama is one example because the Pratt coal mines, so that Pratt, a uh, Alabama had its whole community uh, built off of the prisons. Uh, millions, uh, billions of dollars flowed as a result of cotton and because of the coal mine industry. And with that then, uh, as we look at it today, Crescent City, California, mm. poorest city in America, with the reestablishment of this slavery, uh, Crescent City, California, uh, came and developed a budget for that city of $765 million a year. 1,500 employees, just the trash garbage pickup alone, it's a $131 million contract, uh, 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 1,500 jobs, and so what happened around that? Kmart, Safeway, all kinds of departments, stores. A whole community, as you look at it today, go to Beaton, North Carolina, go to any city you want to go to, a little country town that was dead, now alive because a prison has been put there and the money that that state is getting from just as, as, as during uh, 1860s, the amount of money that was given to a state when they bought a slave or when they sold a slave or when they resold a slave was occurring all over again. Now, I finish with this. In 1934, when Roosevelt uh, established, he, he saw the horrid conditions, he said, we, got, we just can't have this. This is worse than the slavery on the plantations. And we must do something. So he established the federal prison industries. <coughs> and as I said, labor uh, uh, was profusely opposed to this because of the hundreds of thousands of jobs in the public sector. My conclusion is that when they finally agreed, it was because the long-term plan was the Revlons and the IBMs and the so on and the so forth of the world would be able to get their peace by getting this free labor from these slaves who were in prison who uh, received no remuneration. And that presidential uh, 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 edict that was issued in, in 1934 said that monies that were generated were to do three things. Finance the operations. Number two, uh, provide inmate, inmate pay. Number three, subsidize train inmate training because Supreme Court Justice Berger was one of the major forces he said, there must be factories with fences. And uh, within the prisons, we will have all of these factories which will prepare, there's no sense in incarcerating a person for any number of years. And then they're released with no skills mm -hmm. and no money mm -hmm. to reestablish themselves in society. These were, and then Roosevelt added to that that five-member board was to run this operation and anything other than that was the responsibility of the U.S. Attorney General. Now, to me, and the other thing that it said was that federal prison industries has the ability and to sue and to be sued. I would think that as I, as I continue to research on this, that on several fronts, number one, where is the money that was supposed to have been set aside for the training uh, of inmates so that they would have skills and so that they would have some, some money when they got out of the institution? Uh, and what then 
can be since everything, and I'm quoting, all else is in the hands of the U.S. Attorney General in terms of what happens in federal prison industries. So it would seem to me that on one count, there's room for suing federal prison industries for not doing what it's supposed to do. And secondly, uh, uh, petitioning, uh, cajoling, uh, encouraging, pushing the U.S. Attorney General to assume what responsibilities he might be able to assume based upon uh, what the President stated in 1934 in issuing this particular uh, uh, statement, uh, executive order. So that has been, uh, so that what I'm saying is, if you clearly see what I'm saying, slavery has never ended. It continues to this day. Uh, it's not the new Jim Crow as much as it is the old yeah. state. All right. Yeah. 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 And that uh, <laughs> continues to be a long way to use our people and to make money off of our people uh, to make this country what it is. So that's... Uh, make it plain. <laughs> points before, I want to ask a couple of questions, but in the New York Times, I mean, to, to paint the, this picture, remember now in Ferguson, this whole issue of stopping people and finding people and what that creates. In the New York Times today, they do a case study of one person. I don't know where the state is. And it has to do with how they're taking people's driver's license away from them. So they can't get the job, get to a job. The people decide because they want to get a job, they drive anyway, they get fined again. It is this, this cycle of petty offenses that goes on and on and on and in. And of course, in Ferguson, you saw this whole thing about they was financing a whole lot of stuff through these petty stops. They were stopping people, and then people get caught up in the system and whatever uh, is a part of it. Have, are you aware that there's a, there's a paper I have, and I can share it with you all about how they're using child support and how the government takes, provide, say for example, provide families with money because say the father doesn't work. But, and I'm talking about, we're, they're into the billions and billions of dollars, but the family doesn't benefit from that money, nor when the man goes to work, do they benefit from the money that, the, that, that that the, that the man is paying, and that money doesn't go to the children. That money goes directly into the government, and it's to the tune of um, some unbelievable about oh, yeah. billions of dollars. Yeah. There's a big article in the, uh, in this uh, thing on race and property that I was talking to my class. And added to that, say for example, if someone is incarcerated and their wife is receiving some kind of benefits from the government, that's added to his debt. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. That's exactly yeah. Well, Reverend Wilson, I wanted to ask this. This, this Lebanon, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. This Lebanon, Tennessee, the story you're talking about. Oh, yeah, Lebanon, Tennessee, yes. And this is the whole story about that in New York Times today. I only have one question, Reverend Wilson, before we ask, open it up. And that is, because you and I, we were talking about this. This is such a clear picture. What's happening that we don't have the traction? Why is this issue not as prevalent and as prominent as it should be, and how, what steps do you think need to be taken in order to put it where it needs to be placed? You know, and that's why I'm, I'm you know, and we haven't had that discussion in total yet, but this is one of my thoughts. This 20th year coming together where several millions of us come together and make some demands on this government, I think, you know, all of us, you know, there's so many of us doing so many things, but we need a, a large number to speak and speak strong on all of the issues that uh, are affecting us. And one of them at the top 
You know, it's the refusal of this country to deal with racism and white supremacy. Mm -hmm. they, every time something happens, they, they do a little documentary on CNN for, for two days, and, and, and then right. it's back to business as usual. Right. And exactly. one of the reasons they want to do it, don't want to do it, is because if they really address it, every history book that's ever been written will have to be rewritten mm -hmm. because they've lied so much. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the reasons they don't want to do it. Uh, it will change everything. It will change, you know. Uh, and, uh, but I think uh, a, 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 a great number of us with a strong message and demand, I mean, we ain't, as far as I'm concerned, we ain't coming to celebrate in October. We come to the man and in great numbers, you know, men, women, children, everybody. You know, we ain't with the time. I mean, what's going on now? We got it, we got it, we got it. Okay, we'll take some questions out of Reverend Wilson said he has to break in about seven minutes or so, and then he can come back, and we're, we're only going to hold this to about 8.15, about because we keep these meetings to two hours. But we certainly want to give time because we wanted to have a special meeting on this. And as we said before, Don is recording it because we really want a way to amplify this conversation because there's a powerful voice that he is on this issue. So did you have a question or comment? Yes. Yeah, a question and comment. Comment first is one of the things that the, um, that the government does and that, the, that those people do is camouflage they give us something that takes our attention to that. And I think that as much as I respect, I think that Barack Obama is that camouflage for the last eight years, that, oh, we're so busy looking at that that we're not looking at some of the other stuff. And, and, it, and it's been that way. They, they camouflage it um, so that we don't really demand. Um, but one of the things that seems to be apparent to me is that we are in another cycle where this, um, where the white backlash is about to go. Oh my. Mm -hmm. And, yes. you know, this next election is going to show it. Mm -hmm. And we don't, uh, sometimes it seems like we're not looking at the handwriting on the wall. Um, so. And there's so much at stake so much at stake. And I'm thinking that we need to be proactive about looking at, at this, what we need to do, because it's about, to, but the other thing is that we have so much power, we don't even know it. Because we did show that power in that election. Now we let it go, but we have power and we just let it go. Because at first, I think all of us need to be aware that Census lies all the time. Yeah. We are so much more <laughs> than we than that they are willing to report. And you, so. you you are so correct. You know, one of the things that my dear brother Naeem Akbar talks about is the residual effect of white supremacy and racism that created certain mentalities in both black and whites alike mm -hmm. that have never been addressed. So that exactly what you're saying, you're going to see it surface like uh, 1925 uh, in a few days. Because uh, when, you see, what, what creates all the anger and the resentment in these white folks is when they think that they're going to lose their one-upmanship. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the fact that in just a few days now, Majority population in this country will be Hispanic and African American. You ain't seen no shooting yet in terms of white folks going. They gonna go crazy, er, than they are because they can't. They can't fathom that notion. They can't. They can't. They can't. They can't. So that when you see, they they said in a report yesterday that policeman that shot that brother in his back was laughing as he talked to his fellow policeman about right. what he had That's done. Right. That's right. That's that That's what they did. That's what the Ku Klux Klan did. It's the same mentality. It hasn't changed, and it's deep. It's deep. And and and, 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 and until that stuff is surfaced, and we ain't got to talk about the effects on us 
in terms of residual effect, but every time we try to do something, the anger, resentment, the jealousy, the backbiting, the, 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 all that stuff that which, which relates to, to uh, let me just say this, uh, uh, whenever you go to the severe trauma, one of the best ways that the military is dealing with that now, the, the largest number of men who suffer from post-traumatic syndrome is in an uh, institution in California. What they have done is take when we start talking about the Ma'afa, they take them back to the battlefield, mm. Mm. to the very spot where mm. they saw their fellow soldiers' head get blown mm. off, or mm. where they saw this or saw that. And that has been the most effective cure. Mm. Uh, 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 Rachel Yehuda, Jewish woman, so-called number one authority on post-traumatic stress disorder, mm. did a study on Four generation of Jews. The generation that she did it on, their parents were not in Hitler Germany. Their parents were not in Hitler Germany. Their parents were not in Hitler Germany. But these children of four generations removed still have attitudes and behaviors and dreams and nightmares based on what happened in the concentration camps in Hitler Germany. I don't doubt it for a second. But if that be true for them. Thank you. Mm. That's right. Hello. What about 400 years? Mm. Right. There you go. Oh. Uh, Helicopter. The, all that has happened to us in our minds, it's amazing mm. that any of us got good sense. Mm. Uh, at, our, at, our, at, our, at our men's meeting Monday mm. night, there was a brother, and we were talking about post traumatic stress syndrome. There was a brother who had been holding something. There were several uh, Viet, uh, Vietnam veterans in the circle. One brother had been holding something for 35 years, mm. been on seven medications mm. at the VA hospital, can't sleep, going through all kinds. Of, and for the first time, because the foundation was laid for him to talk about it, a couple of brothers here were there. Well, Tyrone, mm. you were there. Were you there, Monday night? No. no. His brother was walking back and forth across the floor. All that stuff was coming out of him. He was crying. Uh, all because he finally had an atmosphere where it was acceptable for him to talk about what he was feeling and going through inside. When you add to that, not understanding what we went through in slavery, all that trauma that C.L.R. James talks about so vividly, Things that they did to us, burying us up to our neck, mm. and then pouring molasses and syrup on our heads and let bees and flies come and eat mm. the flesh away, putting us in a barrel full of nails and roll it down a hill so that when it gets to the bottom of the hill, the person's body is filled with nails. Taking a young boy from his mama when he's a little baby and let him get 15 or 16 and then put him in a cabin and make him have sex with his mother, that's where the word MF comes from. Boy, you are mf because that was your mama. All these things that we have never addressed or talk about, that continue to affect us. You know, uh, what Malcolm said so many years ago, why a uh, uh, black supervisor on the job is hard on you mm. and the white mm. man because mm. when that slave that got up in the big house, got up there, had to be hard on the slaves out in the field than the master was in order to stay there. Mm. Still living that. Mm. Yes. Right. That's right. And never dealt with it. So then we bring that stuff to a conscious level and address it. And for white folks, the same thing. They got attitudes that they don't even know they have. But a situation like what's happening in this country with a black president, never has a president been talking about black That's right. That's right. So even talk about his wife, talk about <coughs> a wonderful African behind. Isn't that something? You know, because their women got to get a shot in the butt to have something. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? But so angry. Yeah, I got a question, man. Okay, so I, I want to thank you, but I want to ask you about the uh, the uh, the suing, right? Because when you look at the federal bureau of prisons right now, okay, 
and you can look at well, not you can look at prison, the prison industrial complex. Period. So that's the feds and the state prisons. Most black men that come home from prison have been tortured. Most of them, you know, because now in the prison systems, you know, it's more about punishing people. It's not about rehabilitation. It's not about reforming people, right? And so we're not getting uh, any of those educational uh, components that we're supposed to get. We're not getting any of the health care we're supposed to get. We're not getting any dental. We're not getting any uh, uh, vocational skills that we're supposed to be right. attaining. Right? None of this stuff is going on right. in prison now. Matter of fact, a lot of those things are cut out of prisons, Absolutely. right? And so now these you 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 hear these horror stories, mostly a bunch of horror stories, especially. Black men that come to D.C., most of them, and I'm telling you, I know what I'm talking about. Most of the black men that are released back to the District of Columbia come back with their head down. You know, with their head down. Because, and if you talk to them, a lot of them end up uh, telling you that they were uh, abused mm -hmm. and tortured in these different prisons. So I'm thinking, like, how do we address, how do we, like, build up a document that speaks to uh, suing. That five-person board okay. sets policy so that when, when it's Supreme Court Justice Berger, he was the one that pushed for the vocational training and all that. So that when Reagan comes through with his stuff, the influence then is to change and just punish. Right. No, no, no kind of rehabilitation. That's out the window. So in the same sense that I think it's going to take a combination. It can't just be the legal. It's got to be the force from us, uh, uh, i.e. with the kind of coming together where we got millions of our people demanding that this change, you see? So that the same way that after... Berger introduced all that, and they, they gung ho went for that for a minute, and then Reagan comes with his stuff and said, "No, it's about punishment." Now he's created this image of us as just as they did in 1860s, mm -hmm. as these heathenistic, uh, crime-prone, evil people that don't deserve nothing but to be locked up or killed. Mm -hmm. You see, so so in the same sense that the policy. Uh, uh, Change, and this is the whole thing about law. I can keep I reference Amos Wilson again because he said it so wonderfully. Laws don't mean nothing if they ain't enforced. Yeah, that's right. Every law we had in the six, 1960s that were put on the books, we had in the 1860s. Right. And then, boom, gone. So, uh, uh, if, we don't, if we don't bring enough power, you look at Second to that, the, 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 Jew, I mean, the Jewish lobby in America today, the gay lobby is the second most powerful lobby in this country. Wow. Did you see what happened in the, in the NCAA tournament? Yeah. yeah. When, 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 uh, when uh, that whole issue came up about this law, they were talking about, and it really wasn't that concrete and definitive that it was going to be discriminatory to gays being able to eat what they want and sleep what they want. The governor of Indiana and Arkansas got on TV and said, we are not going to change this law. Right. It's going to stay the same. And, well. Woman that owns Craigslist, I'm not building my new plant. Jewish lobby. I'm not building my new plant. And, and the, the airline said, we ain't flying nobody in for the tournament. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all from the Jewish lobby. I mean, the gay lobby. Uh, all these businesses pulling back. And so then two days later, both governors come on television. Yeah, we're yeah. going to rewrite the law. <laughs> That's right. That's what they say. Just like that. Just like that. Because of the power. You're not going to get to your call, man. You're not going to get to your call, man. You're giving us too much information. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we're, well, we're I'm going to go back here. Yeah, let me go for a minute. We can entertain a minute. And, and, and we're not going to, and again, uh, we're, we're going to limit it um, to. Uh, so, one of the things.